You've heard from astrophysicists and statisticians, you're about to hear from an economist, and this is the part of the day where we focus on you and the difference that you can make in your choices about your career and how you direct your talents to make the world a better place by way of example of the amazing people that are here on stage with me. And you have their bios inside your program. I encourage you to read them because they will blow you away. So I will just introduce them individually so you know who's who as we're speaking. But immediately to my right, you already know Talithia Williams, who's an associate dean and associate professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd. Next to her is Rukmini Ayer, who is a distinguished engineer at Microsoft for the Bing and the Research and AI groups. Next to her is Denise Ross, who is at the National Conference for Cit on Citizenship and also senior fellow at Georgetown. And next to her is Lillian Carquios, who is an insights manager at Spotify as well as a data scientist. So you can imagine everyone in here is asking themselves, all right, academic pedigree. We have a bunch of PhDs and master's degrees up here on stage. Does it, is it really deterministic in the path that I choose? And I'm just curious, how many people on stage today, when you got your various degrees, knew or had a sense of what you'd be doing today? I did. Okay, so, <laughs> so half of our group did. All right, so maybe we'll start with you, Rukmini, since you had a sense. Yeah. You started off with civil engineering, but then you pursued a PhD in electrical engineering. Yes. And chose to stay in industry. So tell us how you made that decision and how you wind up on your path to where you right. are today. Right, so I, um, I started my first year in civil engineering, and it's because I read Anne Rand's Fountainhead, um, and that was all it took. <clears throat> and at the end of the first year, the counselor told me that, hey, your math and physics grades are really great, but you're barely passing your engineering drawing class. And so he really recommended I do computer science or computer engineering then. And I really didn't want to sit in front of a computer. So I said, okay, what's the worst you know, among the whole slate of degrees? And I said, I'll be an electrical engineer because it was still engineering, and computers didn't feel like engineering. Uh, so I went into electrical engineering, third year in electric, uh, fourth year in electrical engineering, I did my a bachelor's project, and when I was doing that project, I realized, I, I did a project in speech recognition, and I saw dynamic programming for the first time, and I fell in love. And I knew from then that I was gonna work in this field. And had my civil engineering self read a little bit more, I would have maybe figured it out earlier. Uh, but I actually think I'm very resilient because I keep moving around. I choose, you know, I'm, I choose things because I'm interested in them. And I usually uh, like to solve problems, so I end up, you know, veering towards where the biggest problem is. And so from that perspective, I think all these changes have just made me more resilient um, and made me appreciate the diversity of people that you need to bring together when you're really trying to solve something hard. And Talithia, you did not put up your hand, but you also pursued a PhD in statistics. So how did you wind up? Academia tends to be more deterministic. So at what point did yeah. you know that that was the path you wanted to be on? Such a great question. So um, I went to Spelman College for undergrad, which is a historically black college for women in Atlanta. And so it was very empowering to be taught by black women who had PhDs in all these different areas. And so I started in a PhD program in mathematics and took a biostatistics elective, mm -hmm. and we were looking at a data set of mothers, uh, some of whom had smoked during gestation and some who had not. This is uh, looking at historical data, and did like a linear regression. And I'm just like, why are we, first of all, why are women smoking during pregnancy? Like everybody <laughs> knows. And so we're looking at this data, and you know, clearly for women who smoke during pregnancy, they had shorter gestations and lighter birth weight babies. And you know, a professor said, so, you know, what's your conclusion? And we're just like, Duh, smoking, you know, is harmful to your baby. And then he talked about how the tobacco industry refuted the, the data when it first came out. Like, oh no, it's not smoking. It's mother's ethnicity, it's background. And I just remember sitting there thinking like, look at the data, like the only difference in these women is whether or not they smoke. And so that was the moment where I was like, I'm gonna be the one who looks at data and like pulls <laughs> information against the man. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the moment. And then I, I switched PhD programs. So I then applied to stats PhD programs, uh, left my PhD program in math and, and went on into statistics. Yeah. And Academia is a choice versus you chose industry, industry you chose yeah. academia. Was there a reason why you thought, I want to do that in academia as opposed to in industry? Right, summer's off. <laughs> That's good reason. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Summer, good reason. spring break, I wanted to have kids and wanted their schedule to 
match mamas. That was pretty much it. That is an excellent research. <laughs> I, started, uh, I started in research, so I was in research labs, but I quickly veered towards products. And I really like solving product problems, and I'm not such a huge fan of publishing, so I ended up, you know, uh, I just veered in that direction, and then I found success there too, so... Yeah, I think each to his own path. It was re definitely reinforcing. Yeah. So Lillian, for you, you mentioned that you very intentionally wanted to be, get a master's degree and very intentionally went to a liberal arts college despite being STEM oriented. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how yeah. you made that choice. So I, when I was a teenager and going into deciding a college, I absolutely knew that I wanted to study math. That was like not even a question for most people that knew me because I just had a deep curiosity and it had really become part of like how I looked at problems and, and thought about things. And uh, I, so when I was looking at colleges, um, Smith College to me like really uh, was a special place to me beyond it being a women's college, which is really meaningful when you're talking about being a math or engineering student. Um, there was also a place where I could be challenged to think about things differently. So I was very comfortable in my math space. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be somewhere where it was hard and challenging and intellectually um, uh, challenging. So I, you know, I had an undeclared minor in Latin American studies because I just took so many courses in that area. I took sociology courses. I took neuroscience for non-experts, like film courses, logic class. Um, so I just got exposed to a lot of different ways of thinking. And I just found that to be extremely necessary for me to also then be able to go deeply into math. Something about that balance really helped me. Um, and I raised my hand earlier about deterministic paths because uh, at the point where I was going into grad school, I'd been out of school for a couple of years and decided to do a master's. This is before there were any data science programs anywhere for a master's. So what I did was I did this program called an industrial math degree, um, which they offered at WPI in Massachusetts, and it's basically an, an, um, uh, an applied math degree, but you focus on an area in industry, so it's for folks who want to go into grad school in order to go back into industry rather than PhD, and I was able to add a machine learning track to my degree, and so I knew that I wanted to work in technology with data and understand analytics through machine learning. Um, and I was able to do that through this program. And Denise, you're the only one on stage that has chosen government and service as your professional path. And I'm curious if you observe within that field, how much does academic credentials or pedigree matter and did it play a consequential role for you in the path that you chose? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I've spent a few years in the Obama White House and uh, I remember be, when I would be introduced to people, um, it wasn't any credentials that I necessarily had. It was the fact that I had come out of the city of New Orleans. So when someone would introduce me, this is Denise Ross, and she used to work at the city of New Orleans. Wow. So I had this authenticity because I was in New Orleans. You know, I was just sort of doing the um, heads down, doing the hard work of democratizing data um, when Katrina happened. And then we mm -hmm. had a really important mission because um, the federal levies had failed, 80% of the city had flooded, and we were flying blind. We couldn't make basic decisions about like, what child care centers which should we reopen first, and um, you know, where should we put up the health clinics, and which parks which, and, great, and play, great playgrounds should we rehab first. So um, you know, my, my role was, with the team was to help rebuild the data as we rebuilt the city. What's interesting, last night there were a bunch of us that got together from the conference for dinner, and one of the topics that came up at dinner was the view of data science from different vantage points. And in Silicon Valley, it's highly revered. It is, the, it is how the future that all of us were talking about, all this AI, it's coming <coughs> from data science. But that in industry, and in traditional industries, that they don't quite get the role of data science yet. <laughs> and one of the things that you were describing there is, okay, the levies failed, and how, how do we use data to help us make and shape and inform these decisions? So especially, Government, nonprofits, all of that, they tend to be less forward leaning in their understanding <laughs> of technology. <laughs> so what is your observation of how, how can data science stand itself up in those more traditional industries and be seen for the potential that it truly has? Yeah, well, I was really fortunate because I, I moved into um, local government when um, the, the federal government had already set a precedent. 
So Obama had really leaned forward in data transparency and public engagement. And so at the local level, there was this incredible optimism because what we had in New Orleans after the storm was an asymmetry of information. So we couldn't, the, the problem was bigger than government and it was bigger than the people. And we had to align efforts in, it in order to be able to solve the problem. Um, and what government had to do was uh, was release the data that only it had. Mm. Um, and, but their, their information systems were in shambles. <laughs> and so uh, it would really best be described as a pathological complexity mm. inside, inside of government. Um, but what was amazing is that I, there was this incredible talent, this latent talent, that just hadn't had the opportunity to um, really rise to their fullest potential. So when you're working in government, it's really about finding the talent that already exists and helping them be the best you know, and best civil servants they can be. So, Rugwini, you're in a massive organization. Yes. And finding talent, since we're speaking of finding talent and developing it, yes. where that is extremely <clears throat> important. And how do you find that talent? How do you interview for it and select it and assess it? Yes. Especially when I'm sure Microsoft gets like the gold-plated resumes around the world from around the world. Yes, it does. <laughs> are you guys hiring? <laughs> we are hiring. We are hiring. And in, you know, here in Microsoft <laughs> Research, they get you. I think what is the the diamond-plated resumes too. Um, so, so we hire across the spectrum, both industry veterans as well as students uh, coming out of their master's and PhD programs. And <clears throat> the traditional interviews, I think a lot of you, you here must be Silicon Valley veterans. You can regurgitate textbooks. There are those type of interviews. There are the puzzle solving interviews, which gives you a migraine at the end of it. So I'm sure Microsoft has those types of interviews too. Typically my interview, I ask more open-ended questions. Uh, and I'm really looking for people who care more they, they don't just care about what they build, they care about who uses it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people who ask me questions about, hey, who's your consumer? And what kind of challenges do your consumers face with your products? I'm really interested in those people because they really care about the end-to-end -end use of technology versus just, hey, I built this really large neural network with this open source software and it does 95% accuracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I really want to see more than that. So that's mm -hmm. one. And this, the second type of people that I really like are people who, who question a lot. Like, you know, even if I say, oh, we have really large models, they ask details. What do you mean by a large model? Aren't you overfitting on data? They ask questions that tell me that they're thinking very deeply about machine learning and data science. And it's not just, uh, you know, terms and phrases that you use. And I'll add, as someone that doesn't interview candidates for data science, but interviews, a, I probably do two or three interviews a week. Just that questioning mindset, where you asking questions and fr pr framing and probing to understand is just as important as the answers that you come up with. Yes. Um, Lillian, you, you talked about the fact that so you're an insights manager now, mm -hmm. where you're basically trying to have the user at the center and take all of these inputs and figure out, well, how does that all add up to an improved experience, more personalized experience? Yeah. So tell us a little bit how those teams get constructed yeah. and what you think is the most positive dynamic and, and, and how you use all those levers together. Yeah, so at Spotify, it's extremely collaborative and there are lots of very deep thinkers who are experts in their little corners. And it takes a lot of talent on top of that to be somebody that can bridge those experts together. And so I'm, I'm trying something new where um, I really care about human-centered design um, in technology, and I really care about human-centered evaluation of AI and ML products. So I'm trying to drive that forward. There are lots of other people who care too, but we haven't had an organized front together. So what we're trying to do is really think about the different pieces that different teams really care about. So the MLEs might care a lot about performance, machine learning engineers, excuse me, might care a lot about performance of a model and might care about precision and accuracy um, the product managers, who are the, basically the, the business thinkers in an engineering team, might really care about the final business metric. Is this optimizing for the thing that we're trying to improve, that I promised my boss I was going to do, that he promised his boss he was going to do, so all of that. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the research scientists are a, a different group that are interested in the horizon of the state of the art research in this area. And so my team is an insights team. We have mixed methods. 
So we have user researchers who do lots of foundational and qualitative research, one-on-one -on -one with users or at scale for, through surveys or other research. And we have data scientists who dig deep into the data, create metrics, and try to bridge sort of the data to how humans are actually behaving. Um, and so our team is trying to be the, the bridge along all of that so that we can take that state-of-the-art horizon thinking and put it into the product and make it feel so that everyone feels like they're winning by being able to t tell the story from each of their perspectives in a way that makes sense and in a way that makes them feel like they're having an impact in a positive way. Um, so that's the approach that I'm taking and the idea is definitely put the human in the center and figure out how to translate that for each of the different types of experts that we're collaborating with. I think that really reinforces uh, Sue Jay's point earlier about AI requires really high EQ, and that's something that all of us need to take away in however we apply our jobs and our work. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about advocacy versus mentorship, and the distinction that I'm drawing there is mentorship is an expert that is sharing their expertise with you so that you can learn, and advocacy is somebody that is ahead of you on their career path that actively advocates on your behalf to help you with your career. And Talithia, you'd mentioned that as you were going up that you were seeing these really cool black women that were professors. Did you have examples where people advocated on your behalf that really made a difference in your career? Absolutely, I mean, um, I think that uh, definitely in grad school there were times where I was ready to quit and uh, my department chair, who ended up becoming my advisor, was a huge advocate um, in terms of me staying in the program, but also you know, helping to communicate my love for statistics in spite of the ways that I felt like I was not doing well. Um, and when she came back to me, she was like, people don't view you the way you view yourself, right? And so I was sort of really hard on myself. Um, but then also you know, going out on the job market and being able to make those phone calls and say, I've got a great student. Um, I want you to think about her for your position. Um, has, has been fantastic. Um, and then just having mentors uh, outside, so now in my professional life, when I think about what the next step is for me, I look at folks in those positions and I'm you know, really sort of putting myself out there and asking them you know, ways that I can be invited to the table. Uh, it's hard when you're not there, and especially when there aren't a lot of people who look like you who are already at the table. And so um, many of my advocates are majority men, right, white men who, you know, really want to see change in higher education leadership, who are really saying, you know, we need to bring uh, different voices to the table. Um, because it's hard on the outside to say that, but you need someone on the inside who's pushing that. So, yeah. I'm curious for the rest of the panel, how many of you had primarily white men as your advocates? It was a mix for me. So yeah. I, um, I, I can think of two real pivotal um, uh, sponsorships that I that I was benefit that I benefited from, and one was when I was at the city of New Orleans. Um, this was uh, after I came back from maternity leave. I had twins, and uh, and my boss says, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" And I said, "I really want to work on climate change." And um, about six months later, the White House called, and they wanted to they wanted someone to talk to uh, talk, to talk on stage at the launch of the Climate Data Initiative. And Alan handed the phone to me. He was like, the White House oh, wow. called, you know, why don't you wow. take it? Which is sort of the most awesome boss move, right? That you can. <laughs> that is an awesome boss White House move. Awesome boss move. Yeah. He, he's a black man. Um, and uh, he, you know, he just. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> and and he, he gets the best boss award. Um, and then the second time I benefited was when I was at the White House. Um, I was finishing up my Presidential Innovation Fellowship, and my colleague Clarence <laughs> Wardell and I had um, co-founded this project called the Police Data Initiative. It was sort of a side thing, um, but it was after Ferguson, and we both thought, well, what you know, the the national dialogue is. Um, it, there's a lot of people wondering, like, what is is police violence getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it better in some places, worse in others? We had no data to inform the national mm. discussion. And so Clarence and I had this idea like, well, what if, what if police departments released the data they had mm. on use of force? Maybe that would change the national dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had this little side project that turned into one of the most tangible responses to the president's 21st century, 21st century policing task force. But our fellowship was running out. And so DJ Patel, who um, co-coined the term data, you know, data scientist, um, he put Clarence and my name on a post-it note on his monitor. 
and he worked the building oh, to try wow. to figure out a way to get us badged into the White House so we could you know, finish out Obama's term doing this policing work. And, and interestingly, Clarence and I ended up in different, very different roles, but um, DJ found a spot for both of us so we could still do the policing work. That's an amazing wow. story. All right, so take wow. note, everybody. Take some post-it notes. Keep them on your desk for who you need to help along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I should say yeah. that my, um, I've had also white male mentors, very strong mentors. I mean, some who have kept me in my career. You know, when I had my child and I came back, at some point I was really overwhelmed and I was thinking of quitting. And my manager at that time said, you know, there's something called lie low. I know you haven't heard that term, but you could lie a little low, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that really, good. you know, helped me ride my ride those couple of years, the initial couple of years. But I guess the biggest mentor I have is my PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a rare woman in the field of electrical engineering, working in AI, and uh, she was doing excellent work. And she was a role model, and a very she had very strong expectations of her students. So she taught us to present. She taught us to write. Um, she, you know, she advocated for us. She was she was a mentor, teacher advocate all of it put together. But so I think she would be my strongest mentor. Um, but there have been a host of allies all the way um, through Microsoft. She sounds amazing. <clears throat> and I would say for those of you that are at the point in your career where you can be what the <laughs> what Rukmini's PhD advisor is, take a page from that playbook. That is an extraordinary impact. Yeah. Lillian, I know you and Rukmini are working on the WIDS High School program. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to say that yeah. Rukmini is one of my angels. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she connected me to the Woods um, Outreach Program for high schoolers and then to this panel. So thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, so we're, we, you saw me for two seconds on that video this morning. Um, and apparently many high schoolers are going to be hearing about a day in my life. Um, it was secretly two days because I got sick halfway through the first one. So. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm really excited to share just a different, you know, one of the many different ways that you can be a data scientist today um, and just how different everything is. And I did, I think I made some jokes about spending too much time in meetings because one of the things that I want young people to know is like how important collaboration and being able to talk about data science to non-data scientists really is. Uh, so that was sort of the, the part that I tried to highlight. Um, I just think it's really important that we be able to tell the stories of what we're working on to non-experts. Mm -hmm. Imposter syndrome, gotta talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious for the people in this room, how many people here, including the folks on the stage, so there's, everyone has doubts and fears, but have genuinely <coughs> felt like an imposter? Put your hand up. All right. So I do just wanna make a note, pay attention to that next time you're in a challenging conversation or a hard meeting, and remember what you just saw, which was at least half, maybe two thirds of the room's hands went up about how many people might look really confident and be acting like they're all that in the meeting, but on the inside are feeling a little tender. It's, it's one of the things that helps us collaborate better is to remember that about one another. So three of my panelists had their hands up. Yeah. Really, you did. Yeah. So let's talk yeah, about so you. How only, did you master this? See, know, I'm going right? to get on my soapbox for a second here. <laughs> There's a difference between being humble and still having low confidence because you're new and you're still learning and having imposter syndrome. I am, I, I am very lucky that something inside of me, and I'm, I'm sure it comes from my Boricua roots, <laughs> that uh, has always been like, okay, I have something to say, and I'm gonna say it. And even if I'm wrong, I'm gonna learn from whoever else corrects me. Uh, but imposter syndrome isn't something that I've ever really felt in the data science or math field, because I just feel so in love with the work that I do that even if I am incorrect, I know that I can learn from the mm -hmm. things that I'm doing incorrectly. Um, but I absolutely had low confidence early in my career. So I just think it's really important that we make that distinction because that low confidence in your skills um, means that there's something for you to learn. It means that you should reach out to other people to learn and get feedback. Um, and we're, we're all gonna go through that. Um, and I think, you know, I'd love for the conversation to change a little bit about how we can all help each other gain confidence in areas we're not so confident in, and less about whether or not you belong in that room, because every single one of you belongs in this room and in that room, wherever that is for you. So I can talk a little bit about <clears throat> the, 
the area of machine learning and AI is moving really fast. Mm. And so when you begin your career as an engineer or as a data scientist, you're really focused on one area, you're focused on one problem, and you really know the depths of it. But you know, as you, like where I am right now, I cover game theory and auction theory and all these areas, and sometimes I just feel like, oh my God, I gotta read these three textbooks before I know everything there is to know <laughs> about game theory. And then the little voice in my head says, no, that's not your job. There are three other people who are experts in that area. But there is that, you know, you, you do feel sometimes that the information is out of your control, like you really don't know the depths of it. Um, so it does happen now and then yeah. that, you know, you do feel, because the area is just moving really too fast. Yeah. Like, I, you know, you do a tutorial. I did a tutorial in April. I prepared the material in March, and there was a conference in March, and there were three new papers that the audience <laughs> asked me about. So, you know, this is how fast the area is moving. So you do feel that. And you got to just remind yourself that no one is asking you to really have a PhD in every field that you're talking about. Um, it's good to read and know as much as possible, but I think that's where some of the imposter syndrome starts. At least for me, that's where it begins with, that I like expertise, and so I feel like I should have expertise in everything. And I think we should remind ourselves that that's not how it's supposed to be. And I'm sure that is true for everybody in this room. We like being experts. That's why you're in data. Yeah. So, uh, so part of what you're articulating is the distinction between expertise and openness yes. and the desire we have to, sh to display expertise and how hard it is sometimes just to show openness and vulnerability. And <laughs> Talithi, one of the things I appreciate about your presentation was like, hey, here's me, here's my family, here's our data. <laughs> I'm sharing it with the world. It's a TED Talk. My husband's a TED Talk. So how did you get comfortable writing that line and, and being really open about your, your life and being vulnerable in that respect? Yeah, I mean, um, and I want to go back to the imposter syndrome too. I think being open, um, those were just the, the comments that I heard from people. That's really what people want to hear. Like they want to see transparency. They want to identify with you in the ways that you struggle. Um, I think the, the more sort of accoutrements that, that come, the more people sort of put you in this other category. And so I'm always ready to get on stage and be like, let me tell you how not other I am. Let me tell you how, <laughs> you know, I was in Walmart the other day, right? Like, and so, um, and so I, I love that about sharing the data because I think it just makes uh, my life relatable and also makes it... Um, a possibility to folks who may think like, oh, I just, I could never, like you sure can, um, and here's how you can do it. I think for me, the imposter syndrome, it's funny, when I was at Spelman, I didn't have any imposter syndrome, right? I was like, oh, great, I do math, I love math, I could sit in that space and like just take in the mathematics. I think it was when I got to Rice and I was the only woman and the only African American and I was like, whoa, am I supposed to, is this the right place? <laughs> Um, and so even though I think that environment was really uh, supportive and hospitable, um, there were places that I got, I remember my fourth year as a stats PhD student, I was going to a stats conference in my area, super excited, you know, and I'm getting there and I'm like, oh, you, you know, folks who'd authored the books, right, how geeky is that? I'm like, can you sign my book? I learned, you know, math stats from you. Um, but yeah, I remember like walking up to a table and, and you know, the person is like, oh ma'am, are you at the right conference? Because there's another one down the hall. And oh, I was God. like, mm, yeah, you know, I can read this big banner, you know. Um, <laughs> or, and so, I mean, I did you not. Um, and so like, I mean, I didn't say yeah. I was just like, oh, you know. Um, and, and so like, those are the moments I think where other people's opinion of me you know, even though like technically I know I'm little, supposed yeah. to be here and I know, you know, um, that little voice is like, but you know, she said, or, you know, someone says, oh, can you refill the coffee? And I'm like, oh. mm, yeah, nope, not here for that either. You know, I'm all for coffee. Don't get me wrong. Happy to, you know, um, but yeah, sometimes the assumption of people in my feel is that I don't belong. And so, you know, I have to wrestle with that, you know, when I'm going on stage and in front of people, you know, and like kick that voice out. Um, and so that's, for me, that's the imposter syndrome is really owning the space and, and believing that I deserve to be here, even when I know there are people who think I don't, right? It's not like a, do they, do they not? Like, no, they said it, they were clear and they were like, oh, okay, you're here, all right. Um, but yeah, for, for me, that's yeah. the issue. Yeah, yeah so, so maybe we're oh. naming things differently because I definitely 100% relate to what you just said yeah. about other people giving you a 
questionable, like, yeah. yeah, reaction. And I, I think, I mean, it's a personality thing. I just sort of like stomp in there. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I am here. <laughs> but, but I do think we, we encounter those feelings and I think it's yeah. like finding good ways of coping with them in a way yeah. that empowers you rather than makes you feel like you should leave. So you don't cur curse them out, is that what I hear you saying? <laughs> Sorry? You don't, you don't cuss them out? No. Oh, no, I just like give them a look. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's a non-verbal one. Oh, non-verbal, yeah. it's a non-verbal, okay. Yeah. So I wanna make sure, speaking of empowerment, we have a couple, uh, time for a few questions if folks wanna ask some questions. Uh, I've got a microphone right over there with someone right next to it. Hi, so, I uh, am also in state service and I'm very new to data science in general. Um, and I'm being put in the position to teach it <laughs> to other people in government. And um, so one question I had was, what one piece of advice do you have for those that are new to the field or approaching it from a very different background. Um, mine is marine ecology. I like to poke fish. Um, <laughs> on how to enter into the field and persist successfully through time. So I, I can answer that. Um, build on the strengths that people already have uh, because you probably are already doing a lot of data science in your head. I mean, even, even people who don't, aren't scientists, you know, they do. Um, they do the math when they're grocery shopping. You know, they might be sports fans and follow the mm -hmm. stats. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of math and analysis that we do day to day. And so what I do when I'm working with government folks is ident I identify something they've already done um, and sort of lift it up. And I also um, uh, you know, help identify what their pain points are because that's what they're gonna be most motivated to fix. So I don't come in with an agenda necessarily. I might have an agenda, but I don't lead with it. Um, I lead with what are their pain points and how can we use data to stop that phone from ringing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, then they own it. And Talitha, you'd mentioned in your talk about gateway ways to understanding data. Yeah. And what has worked really well for you. Absolutely, absolutely. I think for me, really, I'm connecting the material to the student, right? The more that they're connected to, or even the, not necessarily the student, but the person that we're working with, the more, like you say, we can re relate it to their bottom line or their interests or something that's going to bring them in and kind of hook them. You like what I did there? Hook? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's my advice. <laughs> All right. Next question. Hi, um, my question is around kind of building a confident demeanor when sometimes you're the only woman in the room. And the reason I'm thinking this is more complex than it would sound is I'm always fluctuating. I've had two jobs in the data world. And my first job, I was told that I was overconfident, that there was an air about me down to the way I walked and that I was very off-putting. And then at my new job, I don't know if I overcorrected, but they tell me, we're not sure if you have enough confidence. Like if you could go into a meeting and really command the room, you need to boost your confidence. And when after a year, when I had a chance to kind of establish myself and tell my manager like my previous journey, I didn't want that to be my lead in, he couldn't even picture me getting that feedback in my old job. So I'm kind of confused sometimes. I want to be commanding, but it's very delicate, I feel like, as a woman. Maybe I'm generalizing. I, I don't think you're generalizing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm mm -hmm. curious, Cillian. Yeah. You, you have to integrate a lot of different voices in a room. How yeah. do you think it, it it's, works? Um, there is such a thing as both explicit and implicit bias in giving feedback. So uh, I think the, you know, I have been in that exact same position, is what I'll say. And for me, um, it was really coming to a point where there's a boundary between how I behave and how I live my values and try to connect with people that I work with versus how other people perceive it. And it's important to be able to distinguish the two for your own sanity, right? To be able to like be you. And I honestly, it, the moment for me came when I came back from, so I'd started from getting very personal. I started my job at Spotify already pregnant very secretly, <laughs> and uh, because that's what American women do. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but 
uh, so it was very stressful startup into Spotify, but Spotify is a great environment. So it wasn't, um, it was a lot of it was internal, right? And I didn't realize that until I came back from maternity leave and that additional stress of pretending to be okay all the time like went away. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna be real. I'm just gonna be like, this is what's going on and I'm gonna be myself to as much as I can be and sort of try to meet other people halfway but also not rely entirely on what they thought. In that particular point though about feedback, I think um, uh, it's about continuing to push a little bit gently, sometimes assertively, to your current manager about concrete things, concrete steps, concrete recommendations, trainings, et cetera. Uh, and that gives you two things. One, it gives you a more concrete understanding of what they're thinking about and where they're coming from. And, it put, and the second thing that's really important is it pushes them to think about, is this a real thing or is this about something else? And it really helps them get to the point where they have to challenge their own conclusions and sometimes it just goes away. Just having that conversation makes them be like, oh yeah, that wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but sometimes it can actually help them help you more and help you get, get real steps to working toward where they imagine you could be. I have a very specific technique to also add to that, which is asking questions as opposed to proposing solutions. And you might phrase it very much in the design thinking way. How might we, or I'm curious if, and that lets the other people in the room feel like they're contributing to the conversation and that you can then direct. And so it's a more subtle way to inject yeah. your expertise. So it's a way of being confident but being inclusive to the, your, the first bit of feedback that you got. So we've got one minute left, so I'm going to do a super fast speed round before we wind things up. Can, um, can I, I, do, I do want to oh, let yes. you know that you should be yourself. And the first set of feedback that you got was wrong, and the second set is also sounds wrong to me. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, you know, yeah, don't exactly. assume that people who are giving you feedback know more about you than, they, than you do. And so I, I'd say, I, exactly. I think the first version of you sounded great to me. The second version of you sounds very calm. So <laughs> yeah. combine the two, and you know, there you go. <laughs> uh, question some of the feedback that you get too. But be yourself. In the end, you spend more than... 40 hours, in my case, even more than that at work. And you can be playing in a role at work. So you've got to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Great advice. All right, so real quickly, we're just going to up, go up and back. Um, least favorite word, go. Best. Indifference. Disrupt. Optimize. <laughs> <laughs> and most favorite word. Ooh, I forgot. Come back to me. Um, my most favorite. Team. Data science is a team sport. <laughs> DJ's quote. Learning. Uh, inclusive excellence. That's right. And mine is belief. So we will leave you with those words of hopefully of inspiration to believe in yourselves and in an inclusive learning type environment and to go forward and bring all your amazing data science potential to the world in whatever career path you choose. So thank you. Thank you very much.